Rooney. George Bush takes the oath from Chief Justice William Rehnquist. I, the Emperor of Japan, had died. Many citizens Crime of Tokyo to increase in the cities as drug gangs fight for turf and as drug addicts become mentally twisted. The crew accomplished its main mission, the release of the Magellan State of Alaska has started a criminal investigation into the accident and has complained federal officials are holding back. The movie Batman premiere with star Michael Keaton more wounded when the lone gunman invaded the Cleveland Elementary School and death sentence on the author and his publisher. A tragedy of monumental outrage. Battling an army set against the communists have been forced to give solidarity a chance to go. To flow across the wall and into the, the west. Leaders met on the luxury liner with small talk and jokes about the weather. A year with Andy Rooney, 1989. From year to year, most of us retain not much more than a shapeless memory of the year just passed. It has no form, no meaning, one event following another in a random manner. If there's a pattern to history, it's not obvious to us. Sometimes, long afterward, historians can force a pattern down over what happened and make the events conform to it, but patterns are hard to see close up. Even so, we all pretty much agree, I think, that looking at what's happened is a good way to predict what's going to happen. If we remember where we've been, it can help us get where we're going. For that reason, and because it's a lot of fun, it seems worthwhile once a year to look back at the events we've just lived through and try to make some shape out of them. And even though the shape I see will almost certainly not be the shape you see, perhaps in disagreeing with me, you'll come up with your own shape for 1989. This isn't going to be very funny, and it won't be nostalgic. There's no past we can bring back by longing for it. This is Nicorette. Nicorette is nicotine gum. And Nicorette is available only from your doctor. Ask your doctor whether Nicorette is right for you. They're only at Sears, this large capacity washer and dryer, both with permanent press cycles, both great deals. The washer, 287. The dryer, 247. At Sears and Sears Brand Central now. Welcome to Lumina Sedan. It has been designed with care for you and yours. Listen to the heartbeat. With rear doors that open wide, plenty of room for the family to enjoy. And even Scotch Guard fabric protector comes standard. The family Lumina Sedan. When it comes to new ideas, nobody's winning like. Heartbeat of America. That's today Chevrolet. After the bitter campaign, the words bitter and campaign always go together now, George Bush and his vice presidential choice, Dan Quayle, were inaugurated. The man who for several months seemed to be leading the race to become president, Michael Dukakis, faded into obscurity everywhere but in his own state of Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, as governor and as husband, he was beset by problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's the best thing about being home? Being with my husband. Being with my wife. <laughs> you guys are going to freeze. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Thank you. While everything went wrong for Dukakis, everything went right for George Bush. The economy was strong, employment was stable, and the new president traveled. It was as if he was following the television anchor men around the world. Japan, China, South Korea. Belgium, West Germany, Great Britain, Poland, Hungary, Malta. President Bush even found time to take a relaxed summer vacation at his family vacation home in Kennebunkport, Maine. He played all the games he loved. Broken. President Bush made a more appealing president than he had been a candidate. He was hard to hate. And I didn't feel there was any risk in getting into a little safe launch like that and going back out to the ship. I, it was sheer pleasure, really. Hot dogging? No. <laughs> 
Well, you know, these charismatic, macho, visionary guys, they'll do anything. Yeah. The only local and state elections that made big news were in New York City and Virginia. I am here to claim to be the next governor of Virginia. In retirement, the Reagans were relatively quiet. The former first lady, Nancy Reagan, made news with her chatty book. Chatty, that is. Ronnie was, was and is so, so well-liked, so popular, that they had to take on somebody, and I was the logical person, I guess. Of all the things the Japanese bought in America in 1989, none was more surprising than what they got for $2 million. Ronald Reagan. The courts seem busier than ever with prominent people accused of breaking the law. Oliver North, Zsa Zsa Gabor. The lights, the sirens, everything became up in this cab, the life had to be stopped. Leona Helmsley, Jim and Tammy Baker. Now, or some people want to pull the plug on it, so. <laughs> Tammy was sure God would get Jim off, but he didn't. The best looking witness for anyone in any trial during the year was Colonel North's secretary, Fawn Hall. I'd just like to say that hopefully the good guy will win. So how do you think it went? Even more notable were the prominent Americans who were tried outside the courts. Pete Rose, who's hit a baseball with a bat more times in a professional game than any man dead or alive, was sentenced to capital punishment when he was forced to leave the game he loved after being accused of breaking the rules by betting on baseball games. Pete Rose's unlikely accuser was a brilliant scholar of Renaissance literature and former president of Yale University, A. Bartlett Giamatti, who, as Bart Giamatti, served briefly as commissioner of baseball. A. Bartlett Giamatti died, probably from an excess of living, on September 1st. Have I made mistakes? Oh, boy, how many? I made a lot of mistakes. Mistakes in judgment. Oh, yeah. Speaker Jim Wright got the same sentence as Pete Rose when he was driven out of the only game he ever knew, politics. <laughs> With the exception of abortion, no issue divided the country closer to in half than the question of how available a gun should be to anyone who wanted one. Something far-reaching needs to be done to control these weapons. Now, yeah. a lot of killings take place between people who know well, each other. You. That's because true. Because you have a gun? Because, mm -hmm. because I'd like to protect that right, a right which seems to be under attack. Right. Your rights don't seem to be attacked. If this were a matter of attacking free speech in the press, I'm sure you would be quite outraged at this point. Oh, yeah. We at Cleveland School and the rest of the country want to know, has there been enough suffering to warrant action now? President Bush, a card-carrying member of the National Rifle Association, was soft on assault rifles. I would strongly go after the criminals who use these guns, but I'm not about to suggest that a semi-automated hunting rifle be banned. Absolutely not. The strongest case against guns was provided not by the people who are against them, but by the people who had them. We became accustomed to the ritual of the televised report of the murder, first the house or building in which the murder or murders took place, then the body or bodies being wheeled out on the gurneys by police. Next, a layout of weapons confiscated by police. Nowhere in the world is this kind of murder so prevalent as it is in the United States. Although in Canada earlier this month, a madman with a gun sought out and killed 14 young women at the University of Montreal. In spite of all the evidence that the easy availability of guns was a bad idea that often led to the violent death of innocent people, a great many Americans associated guns with freedom, the flag, and the American way. We're talking so about we're, banning the AK-47 semi-automatic gun. Any firearms. Pardon? We're not going to assist you in, in, in attempting to ban any firearms. Until just a few years ago, when you said drugs, you meant medicines compounded for their salutary effect on the human body. In 1989, drugs meant a mind-altering substance taken as entertainment by people who found life itself 
not interesting enough. Addicts tried with drugs to transport themselves into some mystic world where there was nothing but pleasure and found nothing but pain, misery, and death. The lords of cocaine and heroin shipped their evil powders here a thousand clever ways. After a lengthy search, they found the drugs in a hidden chamber cemented beneath a carpeted passageway. And for every ton that was discovered, 10 tons got in undetected. Authorities kept announcing the biggest drug bust ever. This is one, and it's a hell of a lot of drugs. But we, there's a lot more out there. Nothing, though, seemed to diminish the quantity of drugs available or their popularity. In one instance, kids in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, played drug dealer by pretending to sell crack instead of lemonade. It is scary. It absolutely is scary because these kids are our next generation. The catchphrase for politicians was the war on drugs. If it was war, the United States, population 245 million, lost the war in 1989 to Colombia, population 32 million. Drug czars there created near anarchy by murdering judges, murdering police, and murdering political opponents. On December 6th, the drug trade parked a truck loaded with half a ton of dynamite in front of the Colombian Secret Service office, touched it off, and killed 35 people. In this one country, Colombia, the criminals seem to wield more power than the police. A frightening prospect for our own country to consider when power so often seems close to parity. During his election campaign, George Bush often said he wanted to be the education president. And believe me, I will be the education president for the 90s for the United States of America. Commissions were established to study the problems of the schools. Everyone was generally agreed that schools were not educating children very well. The fault was assumed to lie with schools and teachers. No one wanted to suggest it might be the fault of the parents and the children. No one wanted to entertain the thought that we have some kids who are hard to educate, no matter how good the schools and teachers are. Every year, Volvo and Mercedes spend millions telling you how safe their cars are. This year, Subaru spent $1.49. We squirted dishwashing liquid on the tires of all three cars. And only the Subaru Legacy with full-time four-wheel drive had the traction to handle this test. So if our competition can't look good in soap and water, what happens in mud, snow, and rain? See your Subaru dealer for details on the Special Value Lease Program. What can I take for this miserable cold? A decongestant for your stuffy nose, plus an antihistamine for sneezing, plus a pain reliever for aching, plus medicine to calm your cough. I'm not taking all that. Well, you can relieve the same symptoms just by taking new Comtrex liquid gels. Liquid cold medicine inside an easy-to-swallow gelatin shell for fast Comtrex relief of all these symptoms. It's that simple? You take these. I'm taking Comtrex liquid gels. The newest Comtrex, the all-new way to get fast Comtrex relief. Garfield, I need your help. Hmm, that goes without saying. We have to tell cats out there about new Alpo cat food. Hey, cat food is for the unimaginative. Imagine this. Alpo cat food, so full of nutritious proteins, every serving's like a balanced seven-course meal. And the taste. I'll be the judge of that. So, Garfield, what would you tell cats about Alpo? Two. Demand seconds. New Alpo cat food, canned and dry varieties, tested and mm. approved. It's a major national event as entertainment's hottest stars pay tribute to five outstanding American artists. The 12th Annual Kennedy Center Honors, Friday at 9. Monday Night Football is over. Now what are you going to do? CBS, we're trading our flags for your guys. guys. Our wiggles <laughs> for your giggles. Our sidelines for your punchlines. Monday Night Football is over, so make an appointment to watch the Monday Night Comedies on CBS. Just open wide and say... <laughs> <laughs> Beauty and the Beast, Wednesday. Even in years when nothing much happens, and 1989 wasn't one of those, nature can be depended on to provide some excitement. Weather's only news, of course, when it's bad. 
It was about as bad as weather gets anywhere in lovely old Charleston, South Carolina, when Hurricane Hugo blew through town on September 21st. Buffalo was our biggest city that got the most snow. It almost always is. Too much snow is sort of a tradition in Buffalo. Los Angeles, where smog is the tradition, was the scene of the year's least likely snowstorm. In Monroe, Louisiana, they got nine inches of rain, and the cameramen got their traditional shots of people paddling rowboats in the streets. They could have used that rain in Kansas in March, where the wheat withered for lack of any rain at all. Freezing rain and icy roads made the worst traveling conditions for cars and the most dramatic pictures for photographers. Right in, boy. Most parts of the country got some kind of weather that will enable those who lived through it to tell their grandchildren, we don't get weather like that anymore. For all our talk about how good or how bad the weather is, Americans enjoy the change. Toward the end of his life, the great essayist and part-time poet E.B. White wrote, all the things I want I've had, true love and change of weather. Unlike hurricanes, earthquakes don't get cute names. It seems certain that Hurricane Hugo would be the worst natural disaster of 1989 in the United States until minutes before the first pitch of the third game of the World Series between the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland Athletics. The Oakland A's take, take, hey, well, we have an 15 seconds later, 67 people had been killed, a major elevated roadway had collapsed, and $10 billion worth of property damage had been done. I just can't believe it. I just can't believe it. I just lost everything. But when it happens, you realize how tragic it is. They got there, and oh my God, it's not there anymore. Terror, total terror, of not knowing what happened. Fear nothing. You are worth more than a flock of sparrows. When the earthquake hit, I snuck under my bed, or the school told me to get under something right away. It wasn't believable. Even when you saw it, it was unbelievable. Unless you're standing here, you have no idea the magnitude of the rescue effort that's been going on in this place. It's a very dangerous rescue operation. People up there that are doing that are actually risking their lives. There were two kinds of disasters in 1989. There always are. The first kind were the natural disasters over which we have no control, those hurricanes, floods, and earthquakes. The other kind of disaster is man-made, although seldom made on purpose. There were 1,284 people killed in crashes of U.S. aircraft in 1989. Passengers were not deterred from flight, either by planes that came down or by prices that went up. Having seen how badly many airlines handle other aspects of their business that are out in the open, no one should be surprised to find airline maintenance in the same league with baggage handling. It's on time performance. Or even with the food on board. DC-10, 112 killed. There were other spectacular air crashes too, proving only what we've all known all the time. It's dangerous being up in the air in a heavy piece of machinery when anything goes wrong with what keeps it up. There was an explosion in gun turret two on board the battleship Iowa. The Navy concluded that it was murder. It was murder and suicide perpetrated by a lovesick homosexual for his companion on board. There were charges that by making this charge, the Navy was covering up its own mistakes. The fact remains, 47 young American sailors died. In a world where men and women were so often cruel to each other, the human spirit was revealed at its best with its concern for animals in trouble. 
A lot were in trouble in Alaska. This otter had been lovingly shampooed. In San Diego, this rare, just-hatched condor was given his first square meal by human beings. This beleaguered bear was brought safely to Earth. The second bear, up a pole without a paddle, got the shock of her life. Happy ending. A little banged up, but the bear survived and was reunited with her cub. And it seems strange in a world where we regularly awoke to news that some number of people had been gunned down, that there were still peaceful people, like Bill and Helen Rosen, who wanted nothing more in life than a Washington Valley filled with tulips. Business was good in 1989, although business was better for business than it was for anyone else. What businessmen seemed to be making most of was money. The business world continued to confuse what was good with what would sell. Instead of making things, companies were busy buying and selling each other as a way of making money without making anything else. A Wall Street takeover firm that knew nothing about cigarettes or biscuits took over the former Reynolds Tobacco Company, which had already merged with Nabisco in a deal you wouldn't understand if I could explain it to you, which I can't, for a world record $25 billion. Sony bought Columbia Pictures for $3.4 billion, small potatoes. Time bought Warner Communications, formerly Warner Brothers, for $14 billion, or vice versa, I forget. Anyway, Ford Motors, which knows a good car when it sees one, bought the British Jaguar. An economic theory of mine is no product made by a small company ever got better when it was taken over by a big company. The Japanese, meanwhile, bought Rockefeller Center from John D's grandson, David, who presumably needed the money for $846 million. The rich got richer. The Dow Jones average began the year at around 2168, and last time I looked, it was 2700. If you had stock worth $10,000 one year ago, it would be worth about $12,000 tonight. Charles Keating, a one-time Olympic swimmer and more recent wheeler dealer, finally got in over his head when his Lincoln Savings and Loan Association collapsed in a morass of charges of influence peddling and dishonesty. Keating's Lincoln was only the tip of a dirty iceberg. The whole savings and loan business, deregulated under Ronald Reagan, went sour with unsavory deals. The savings and loan caper may cost American taxpayers, some of whom try to put a little away each week, $200 billion. Economists kept reporting that inflation was low at 4 to 5 percent, but you could have fooled most of us who had to buy clothes and groceries. Anything that cost $5 a year ago seemed to cost us $6 today, which is 20 percent inflation. For some reason no one who'd say could account for, gas prices rose after the Exxon oil spill in Alaska. The price of oil today is up over a dollar. That's more than 5% in one day. And consumers are being gouged in this process. That brings me to another economic theory of mine. Everything makes the price of everything go up. Nothing makes the price of anything go down. Advertising filled every nook and cranny of our lives. Everywhere Americans looked or listened, they were being appealed to to buy something. The emphasis was on sales, not on production, on quantity, not on quality. On television shows, there were more commercial minutes. A show advertised as one hour was more like 45 minutes of show and 15 minutes of commercial. The pages of the newspapers that criticized those television shows for their commercial intrusions contained more advertising than news. In supermarkets, loudspeakers implored us to buy this, buy that. Leaflets on our doorstep advised us of once-in-a-lifetime sales, day after day. Our mailboxes runneth over with junk mail. At dinner time, our phones rang with free offers that we knew perfectly well weren't free at all. It was business as usual in the United States in 1989, and as usual, wasn't bad.
She's got a leg. Sheer elegance, the pantyhose that looks and feels like real silk from the Orient. Well, I want her. I've got to have her. She's got less. They're only at Sears. This large capacity washer and dryer, both with permanent press cycles, both great deals. The washer, two eighty-seven. The dryer, two forty-seven. At Sears and Sears Brand Central now. These are two identical slotted spoons and two very different spaghetti sauces, Prego and Ragu. When you see them side by side, the difference really comes through. Prego spaghetti sauce. Homemade taste. It's in there. I'm Kathleen Sullivan. And I'm Harry Smith. All of us from CBS This Morning want to wish you a happy and healthy new year. A year with Andy Rooney will continue. Panthers of Pittsburgh, the Aggies of Texas A&M, the John Hancock Bowl, Saturday on CBS Sports. Get ready for a cop who will really take you to the mats. Shadow Stevens is Max Monroe, Loose Cannon, premieres Friday, January 5th. Freedom. Ten years, freedom, the fever, and the faith. Continuing a look back at the 80s tomorrow on the CBS Evening News. This is CBS. I'm Jenny Roberts, coming up on Channel 6 Action News. Try to put a stop to a big brush fire in West Dade. We'll have details. South Florida supplies make their way to Panama. Giselle Fernandez was there. Her report coming up. Sheikh Mohammed al Fassi is wanted by the police. We'll tell you why. And cardboard cops putting a crimp on crime in Dallas. Tonight at 11. You can decorate your whole house at Marshall's if you wanted to. I can get my sheets, my domestics, towels, linens. It's not just a store, it's a store with everything. Marshall's bath and bed extravaganza means beautiful savings like these luxurious bath towels, $3.99, and your favorite comforters, all sizes, $19.99, and the dreamiest pillows, all sizes, $4.99. Marshall's, the first name and brand names for less. It makes me feel even better when I sleep at night knowing how much money I save. For those considering a Toyota Camry, some revealing news. There's another five-passenger sedan with front-wheel drive, fuel-injected engine, roomier trunk, and it's $1,200 less than the Toyota Camry. In fact, this German-engineered 1990 Volkswagen Jetta GL, including its new features, costs less than last year. So stop tearing your hair out about new car prices. Until December 31st, visit your South Florida Volkswagen dealer for special year-end deals on select 89 models. Democracy had its best year since 1776. Our way of life began to look good to the billion and a half people living under communist rule in both Europe and Asia. They wanted some of the good things we have. Good things like food, liberty, real news, and freedom to go where they wanted when they wanted to go there. Mikhail Gorbachev changed the Soviet Union and charmed the pants off the rest of the world in the process. The country Ronald Reagan had called an evil empire was not nearly so evil. It seemed too good to be true to some Americans who were in love with hating Russia. Many Americans, though, wondered where the bad guys went all of a sudden. What are the KGB agents who planted bugs in the wet cement walls of our new embassy doing for a living now? And where are the guards near Checkpoint Charlie who gunned down East Germans trying to escape to the West? For the first time since 1917, the Russian people were free to speak out against their own government, and they spoke out. He, he wants he wants to do, but it's too slowly, too slowly. The Soviet Union voluntarily reduced the number of weapons it kept aimed at the West, it didn't matter that the reduction may have been more of an economic necessity than a political concession. That reduction put pressure on President Bush to reduce our own $300 billion weapons budget. Welcome pressure for a president who didn't want to raise taxes, but ominous for a U.S. economy 
that has depended so much for its prosperity on making weapons. The Soviet Union relaxed its grip on Eastern Europe and its leaders began to behave like human beings in international affairs. Andrei Sakharov, its most prominent dissident, was elected to the Soviet Congress. Andrei Sakharov died on December 14th. Sad, but we should all live long enough to see our dreams come true, as he did. Mikhail Gorbachev traveled around the world as an ambassador of the new non-communist communism. Cuba was one exception to the worldwide loss of confidence in communism. They kept at it. In Italy in December, in one of the most unlikely get-togethers of the century, Gorbachev met that other world traveler, Pope John Paul, the devil at the pearly gates. The ideological earthquake began early in the year in Hungary, when soldiers tore down this barbed wire fence along their Austrian border. In Estonia, people joined hands to indicate their common belief in democracy. In Poland, a shipyard electrician named Lech Walesa spoke for the Polish people's great yearning for freedom and forced an election that swept out the communist leadership. In Beijing, China, Chinese college students took over Tiananmen Square that's the Chinese equivalent of Red Square in Moscow. We had never known they existed. The students put up a 30-foot model of our Statue of Liberty. For a short time, it appeared as though everyone in China wanted what we wanted them to have, a change of government. Live pictures of events in Tiananmen Square changed the American outlook on what Chinese people were like. The struggle for democracy will not stop until we get what we want to get, democracy and liberty. Dan Rather of CBS News was unceremoniously cut off the air in the midst of a broadcast when Chinese officials decided freedom of speech had gone far enough. The blank television screen was dramatic evidence for the whole world to see that Chinese communist officials had decided there was a limit to how free they would allow speech to be. The old communist line leaders weren't going to fade quietly away. With cameras off, the Chinese army rolled in. This picture of a single man holding up a column of 50-ton tanks was one of history's momentous trifles, small in itself, but just as the picture of Washington crossing the Delaware stood for more than a man in a rowboat, this picture in Tiananmen Square represented the stand free men were taking against oppression everywhere in the communist world. On September 12th, the Hungarian government, fed up with communism itself, decided to ignore its agreement with East Germany to block the passage of East Germans to the West. That first day, 7,000 East Germans left for the freedom of West Germany by way of Hungary. It was a crack in the dam. By November 9th, the East German government conceded defeat. It was apparent to the whole world that there was something wrong with any country that had to put up a fence, not to keep others out, but to prevent its own people from leaving. Perhaps never in the long history of civilization had there been such concrete evidence, 26 miles of it, of the failure of a political philosophy. East Germany opened its borders, took its machine gun toting guards off the wall, and opened the floodgates to the West. By November, the great turning away from communism seemed over. It wasn't so. The people of Czechoslovakia's smoldering resentment of that Russian invasion of their country in 1968 burst into flame.
The last hardline communist dictator, Nicolae Ceausescu, was driven from power in Romania. It was a bloody revolt in which 60,000 people were killed. On Christmas Day, in a move that embarrassed their supporters, including the United States, the revolutionaries executed Ceausescu and his wife, Elena. In one of the year's memorable events, Lech Walesa addressed the United States Congress. The wall that was separating people from freedom has collapsed. Mam nadzieję, że narody świata już nigdy nie pozwolą na budowę takich murów. And I hope that the nations of the world will never let it be rebuilt. The standing ovation provided one of 1989's most touching moments, bringing tears to the Polish hero's eyes and to some of ours. If things were going right for the good guys in Eastern Europe, they weren't going that way everywhere. There was more hopelessness than hope in the Middle East and in Central America. <laughs> In Panama, General Manuel Noriega, the Panamanian strongman and drug dealer, lost the election there, had his goons beat up one of his opponents, Guillermo Ford, and thumbed his nose at the United States. He got away with it until the early morning of December 20th when U.S. troops moved in. Events in the Middle East were depressingly violent and idiotic, with mad and thoughtless acts of terror on every side. The once beautiful tourist city of Beirut was reduced to rubble in a religious war that few Americans even tried to understand. Eight American hostages continued to be held in captivity. In one of the cruelest acts in all history, Colonel William Higgins was hanged. Outraged Americans wanted us to go in and free the captives and punish our tormentors. But no one knew for sure where the captives were held or who held them. You can't discuss the situation between the Israelis and the Palestinians rationally on a broadcast like this without enraging both sides. The openly aggressive Israelis made it hard for us to be best friends. The young Palestinian Davids were out daily, trying to slay the giant Israel with rocks. Israelis retaliated with guns. <laughs> On July 6th, a Palestinian terrorist forced a bus off the road, killing 14 Israelis. And that's the way it went. An eye for an eye, a bus for a bus, a young life for a young life. Neither wanted a rational settlement. They wanted territory and power. OK. Most days, this business is a lot of fun. But today, it's giving me a splitting headache. For this kind of pain, I don't take aspirin or Tylenol anymore. Today, I go straight to Advil. One Advil is usually enough, but for a really tough headache, it's two Advil, and that pain will be history. And Advil is gentler to my stomach than aspirin. I like that. Advil makes my job a lot easier. Advil, tablets and caplets, advanced medicine for pain. If Oat Bran made news, this should make history. Psyllium, an important ingredient in a new cereal from Kellogg's, Heartwise. Psyllium is a natural grain with more than eight times the soluble fiber of Oat Bran. And that gives the delicious, naturally crunchy flakes of Heartwise the highest level of soluble fiber you can find in a cereal. Heartwise, to get more than just Oat Bran, take a word to the wise. It may be Red Lobster's most perfect meal. Petite Danish lobster tails. Mmm, the sweetest ever. Plus flame-broiled shrimp. Delicious. 
Next, oh, sizzling scampi. All this lobster and shrimp on one plate, perfectly priced. Just $8.95 for a few weeks. Red lobster for the seafood lover in you. And for the holidays, call for party platters to go. Ready in just one hour. Jessica's in Moscow. Jessica's in jail. Jessica's got the KGB on her tail. Your stay in Russia has just been extended. Murder, she wrote. Then, we knew the entertainer. Now, meet the man who was a living legend. Why does the press keep attacking me? The Man Revealed. Liberace. Behind the Music. Sunday. The medical community announced there were more surgeons than we need and patients hoped that this law of supply and demand would drive down the price of being opened on an operating table. Lots of luck. The major development in medicine was the expanded use of a machine that takes internal pictures of our body without exposing it to the harmful effects of x-rays. The process is called MRI, short for magnetic resonance imaging. In many hospitals, it's replacing x-rays. There was some recognition in 1989 of the fact that many of the ills that kill us are self-induced. Too much alcohol, too much food, drugs, homosexual unions, cigarettes. They were all known to lead quite often to premature death. The moral issue was this. If a person is repeatedly warned that something is damaging to his health and he continues to do what he knows is bad for him, is society responsible for his medical bills? Nothing good happened to the earth itself in 1989. It was as if it were being tortured to death by the people who lived on it. For more than 100 years now, we've been taking all the good things up out of the ground, turning them into garbage, and then throwing the garbage away. Ruining in the process two places, the place where we dug and the place where we dumped. We talked for years of throwing things away, but suddenly there was no more away. Away was our own backyard. Americans threw more away than most nations have to begin with. We don't fix much of anything either. We throw away the old ones, buy new ones. which will eventually be thrown away. The Energy Department asked for $80 billion for what it called environmental cleanup. Among the more disgusting examples of pollution were the hypodermic needles discarded by hospitals and drug addicts that continued to wash ashore along our ocean borders, those once magnificent sandy beaches. The needles joined the endless and indestructible, non-biodegradable supply of used plastic containers that floated ashore. The once pristine atmosphere of Barry Goldwater's Arizona became as smog-laden as any other American city. In Brazil, they were burning 100 square miles of the best timberland left in the world every day, ruining their invaluable forests and creating smoke clouds so massive that their effects were felt all over the world. One of the most damaging unnatural disasters of the century, the 11 million gallons of thick black oil that covered one of our great natural places, Prince William Sound in Alaska. It happened when a captain, accused of being drunk or careless, abandoned his responsibility and ran the giant tanker, the Exxon Valdez, into a rock. They committed themselves to cleaning up the beaches. We expect them to clean up those beaches. The proof is in the pudding, and we will be um, checking to make sure that that occurs. I saw some horrible slicks today with, with uh, otters right in the slicks. This is clearly futile, given the hundreds of miles of coastline. Right now, many of the breeding colony areas are in jeopardy. Their response was too little, too late, and they've made too many excuses. There was, however, a marked increase of awareness of pollution by Americans. Our environment was the Vietnam of 1989. Greenpeace was at war with the Navy. Vietnam. In 
industrial plants that used to be able to dump their effluents at will were publicly embarrassed when the National Wildlife Federation named the nation's 500 worst industrial polluters. In New York, a city department cut down 40 68-year-old maple trees 15 inches in diameter along one street that sorely needed them. The department announced the next day that it was all a mistake. Scientists, who knew more than most of us could understand, convinced us that we were not only ruining the Earth, but ruining the atmosphere protecting the Earth by burning off that protective layer of ozone that surrounds it. They predicted that a global warming would follow that could foreshadow the end of civilization on Earth. This is the way the world ends, wrote T.S. Eliot. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. Considering that sports are for fun, there were a lot of things that happened in sports this year that weren't much fun at all. The image the world had of the British as courteous and gentlemanly cricket players was destroyed by its soccer fans. In Sheffield, England, fans gone wild tried to force their way into a stadium already full and crushed to death 95 people in the process. At the University of Oklahoma, the football team performed better on the field than off. Its quarterback was arrested for drug dealing. Three linemen were arrested for gang rape. The second string quarterback shot a teammate and the university was put on probation for what amounted to buying football players. Canadian Olympic sprinter Ben Johnson's coach finally admitted Ben took steroids before the Olympic Games. He sure looked as though he'd taken something. Professional athletes were very expensive to buy this year. Just as an example, the New York Yankees, a losing team, agreed to pay a losing 32-year-old pitcher named Pasquale Perez $5.7 million for three years. Pasquale won nine and lost 13 for Montreal last year, and he's had a cocaine problem. You can imagine how much they were paying players who were young, good, and drug-free. A 490-pound American from Hawaii named Saliva Atesano won the most repulsive sporting event, the Sumo Wrestling Championship in Tokyo. The kids from Trumbull, Connecticut won one of the nicest sporting events, the Little League Championship. And the great Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, born Lou Alcindor, apparently had all the money and all the basketball he could take. He dunked for the last time and retired from basketball at age 42. He had scored 38,387 points the kind of basketball statistic that makes hockey fans yawn. Emperor Hirohito, the spiritual leader of Japan since before the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941, died. Hirohito was never an American favorite. President Bush went to the funeral to pay this country's respects, what there was of them. There were several deaths that went unmourned in America, even those who opposed the death penalty found little to mourn in the execution of mass murderer Ted Bundy, although the women he murdered are no less dead. The Iranian leader, the Ayatollah Rahola Khomeini, died at age 89. His funeral, during which followers tore open his casket and pawed at his dead body, was as bizarre as his life. The president did not attend. Earlier in the year, Khomeini had put out a contract for the death at the hands of any Muslim who could do it, of the esteemed British author, Salman Rushdie. Rushdie had written the novel Satanic Verses, which Khomeini found offensive. Americans found Khomeini offensive. And the famous striking to the ground, not quite to the boring mass, all the humanity and all the... That was the voice of Herbert Morrison the day in 1937 that the dirigible Hindenburg crashed in Lakehurst, New Jersey. Mr. Morrison died in January. 49,187,000 people died in the world in 1989, 
as near as we can figure. They were almost all friends or relatives dear to someone. 2,214,000 died in the United States. The wonderful Lucille Ball died, but you know that, of course. You know, too, that Sir Lawrence Olivier passed away. The peerless Ray Robinson, the talented Gilda Radner, the great Irving Berlin, Betty Davis, all gone and with great notice in death as in life. Did you know, though, that Alfred Wilson died of a heart attack on Martha's Vineyard at age 85? Mr. Wilson was on the American crew that won the Olympic gold medal in 1924. During World War II, he was in charge of the Minneapolis Honeywell Company's bombsite division. Darwin Klingman died of a brain tumor. Mr. Klingman was a computer genius we could ill afford to lose. He was 45. It's likely you never heard of him. Howard Simons died of pancreatic cancer. Mr. Simons was a great newspaper man, widely known among his peers, and hardly known at all by anyone else. That's the way it was with most of the 49 million people who died. They died unknown, except to a few friends, because their best work wasn't done on television. Their loss is nonetheless to be mourned than Lucille Ball's by the people who knew them, or by us all. It's estimated that 139,428,000 babies were born in the world in 1989. You wonder which of them will be president, or if there's a Vladimir Horowitz among them, a Carl Hubble, or a Barbara Tuckman. We cannot yet give you the names of the great scientists, the magisterial judges, the able politicians, or the best writers and artists born in 1989. We cannot tell you who will replace Darwin Klingman. His name is not yet known to us. It was like an operation in the heart of Berlin, and the heart was divided. I see. So I called my mother in East Berlin. Then I called my sister in East Germany. It's wonderful around this time, especially around Christmas time. I mean, Family. they can come and go. Uh, I have seen with my eyes, the war is open, mother, come, you can see me. What a wonderful world. They're not little baby ones. Is all right? Yeah, I got a headache. They're full-grown, adult-sized bangaroos. I can't keep them from coming, but I can't bang them back with the adult pain reliever. Bear, it's strong. It's not an aspirin substitute. It's made for adults. Maybe that's why so many doctors take Bear. Doctors are adults, just like you and me. For adult-sized pain, Bear, the wonder drug that works wonders. Our McDonald's was between school and home. Mom would say, don't stop, you'll spoil your appetite. But one blustery afternoon, there it was. McDonald's glowing, inviting us. Come on, let's go. Yes, I would spoil my appetite with that hot, beefy burger in my cold little hands. Then I got home. Hey, look what I got. Nailed. Dad had brought McDonald's for dinner. To this day, I still can't pass up those big, beefy burgers. That's the way it went in 1989. We missed a lot on this broadcast, of course. For instance, there were several movies that moviegoers talked about. One of them was Batman. The other movie was Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Grown-ups preferred Woody Allen's crimes and misdemeanors. Larry Gelbart's play, City of Angels, opened on Broadway to big reviews. In about half of all marriages in the United States, both the man and the woman were working. Not because they wanted to, but because they needed two incomes. The issues this year were abortion, AIDS, drugs, guns, abused children, and the homeless. Americans were torn between feeling sorry for and being exasperated by people in trouble. If all men are born equal, what happened here anyway? 
And how do we help the unlucky poor and the desperate homeless who can't cope with life without encouraging sloth among others? 50% of all the time of doctors assigned to hospital emergency rooms was devoted to people who ended up there as a result of some kind of drug or criminal activity. The Supreme Court, whose average age is 68, ruled in favor of the death penalty for teenagers. People who opposed abortion on grounds it was murder were, generally speaking, in favor of the death penalty. People in the news were in the news. Diane Sawyer was induced to leave CBS for ABC by an offer of $2 million a year and a chance to appear with Sam Donaldson. Connie Chung left NBC to return to CBS for only a million and a half dollars, but she reporting. gets to work alone. Good evening. Magazine publisher Malcolm Forbes gave himself a 70th birthday party in Tangiers to which he invited 700 people. Money was no object for Mr. Forbes in arranging the party, considering that money was the object. A great many people, most of whom were not invited to it, said it was a terrible party. Picasso's painting, O La Pain Agile, sold for $40 million. His Yo Picasso went for $47 million. I personally like the cheaper painting better. So that's the way it's been in 1989. I hope I haven't offended you with my opinions. I decided on them quickly, but then I wrote them down, and by the time I'd read them over a few times, I believed them. It would have been almost as easy for me to have some other opinion to begin with, with which you might have agreed. I'm only really certain of one thing. If you lived through it, 1989 was a great year to be alive. Good night. We all pretty much agree that looking back at what's happened is a good way to predict what's going to happen. If we remember where we've been, it can help us get where we're going. For that reason, and because it's a lot of fun, it seems worthwhile once a year to look back at the events we've just lived through and try to make some shape out of them. Even though the shape I see will almost certainly not be the shape you see, perhaps in disagreeing with me, you'll come up with your own shape for 1989. For a transcript of this broadcast, please send $4 to A Year with Andy Rooney, 1989, 267 Broadway, New York, New York, 10007. It's Debbie Reynolds. Let's party. And the song stylings of the Judds on the Pat Sajak Show tonight. Live, the first party of the decade with hosts Natalie Cole, Gary Morris, Melissa Manchester, Charlie Daniels, Tanya Tucker, and Brent Busberger. Happy New Year, America Sunday. Kick off the 90s with the 33rd Annual Cotton Bowl Parade hosted by Greg Gumbel and Kim Zimmer, plus Kevin Dobson, Mary Fran, and the 101st Tournament of Roses Parade New Year's Day. Monday, will a New Year's bash without booze be a bust? I spent the last half hour in the bedroom trying to guess how many coats were on the bed. Or a blast. It's an all-new Murphy Brown. Then, on an all-new Designing Women, ring in the New Year with Charlene's new arrival. I think we're having a baby. Join guest Dolly Parton for a special one-hour episode. Go! Monday. This is CBS. Good evening. I'm Jenny Roberts. Coming up on Channel 6 Action News. The cold is gone, but now the heat is on. Officials battle a big brush fire in West Dade. American relief supplies are flown into a Panama desperate for help. Giselle Fernandez made the journey and has details. Remembering children who have died in our community, a mass for their parents. And these cops might be stiff, but they're putting a crimp on crime. Stay tuned. Action News is next. Saturday only. Jay Byron's year-end riot. Great savings on special items, 8 a.m. till 9 p.m. all day Saturday. Plus, 8 to 11 a.m., 50% off selected doorbuster buy. Mrs. Washable silk tops. Men's golf traders casual pants. Strike knit sport shirts from Van Gusen and Arrow. All 50% off. 50% off doorbuster buy. Saturday, 8 to 11 a.m. A riot of savings all day. Jay Byron's year-end riot. Saturday.